Great, so we've got a feel for the Frogan's technology. We understand what uh, Frogan's site looks like. And uh, in the um, uh, preceding uh, discussion that we had with Emory, uh, we also talked about how the Frogan's technology came about and the fact that it sits very much on top of the domain name system, the DNS. As I mentioned in the uh, opening part of uh, today's proceedings, we're very, very lucky and fortunate and happy to have the inventor of the DNS with us here today, Paul McApetris. Uh, can I call Paul to the stage, please? Thank you very much. Paul, welcome. Thanks so much for being with us. I feel like I'm in a presidential debate. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to ask you any political questions, don't worry. Um, but I would like to know uh, more about the DNS and how you came to uh, invent this uh, um, uh, technology. Uh, could you explain also uh, very quickly what it does, bearing in mind that uh, not everyone is technically minded, so uh, may not uh, fully understand the details, but uh, uh, we'd like to for people to understand why the DNS is such a cornerstone piece of the internet. Sure. Um, well, just to use your slide, uh, we have a domain name there, conference.frogans.org. Um, and I think the first thing to explain is that's embedded in a web address, but you could also use that same name if you wanted to as part of an email address. Um, and originally, the theory was that the system was designed so that you could name computers. Um, but uh, I always tell people that all of the infrastructure that we have is three parts, hardware, software, and configuration. The uh, configuration part is the problem that the DNS is designed to address. It's designed so that you can connect things together in the internet. Um, the way it got started was that we had an old system where all of the configuration of the internet was in one file and you would call up Stanford Research Institute and you would download all the configuration in one file. As you can imagine, we probably couldn't get to the billions of users that we have today with one file if we had to ship it around every morning with a new update. So the uh, important thing about the DNS is it lets, once you've registered uh, the Frogans top level domain with ICANN or registered Frogans.org, you get to configure your own little chunk of data. And since everybody does it, so the DNS is two, there's two pieces of magic, one of which is it chops it up into somewhere north of 100 million separately managed domains. So you have Frogans, you're happy, you do your own thing, and you don't have to worry about a21.com, which happens to be my domain. So we can separately manage it. That's one part of the magic. The second part of the magic is you don't ask people about how to get to a21.com, you assume that the system will know how to do it. So the fact that it's broken up into 100 million or more pieces, but yet appears to be one coherent service that you can run around, that's what the DNS is all about. So it's the basis of your email, it's the basis of your HTML addresses, um, it's the basis of host names, which was the original purpose, but it was always designed to be extensible. So when you invented the DNS, I think in 1983, you probably uh, didn't uh, think about new technologies like Frogan's. Uh, today, seeing the Frogan's technology and looking at, uh, at the way it works and the way it, it also uses the DNS, uh, are you surprised by uh, new technologies coming to the fore, uh, such as this one, and using the, the, uh, the system that you invented, or is this par for the course? Uh, in one sense, it's part of the course. Uh, I think that any interesting technology, if it's designed to be used by other people, you shouldn't be able to figure out all the uses. If you could figure out all the uses for a particular piece of technology, it's not really interesting, or at least that's the way I look at it. You know, you're designing something that will hopefully be used for years or decades or whatever, um, and people are going to get smarter. So, you know, the, the way the DNS technology was built was based upon my experience at a number of uh, 
different networking efforts before that, and I expect somebody else to come along, perhaps like Frogan's, and use the DNS to build their own dream. Someday, Frogan's perhaps will be uh, used by somebody else to move on to the next level. Um, you know, technology is like that. You're always building new technology on top of what you've had before. You mentioned, uh, you explained the resolution of uh, uh, domain names and the way that happens uh, with the domain name system. You mentioned the fact that it's a distributed system, so uh, uh, it can be managed uh, by anyone can manage their own domain. It's a, a hierarchical system that uh, uh, allows each of us to buy a, a domain and use it and manage it the way we want to. Um, it's also something that supports that is free, that it can be used by anyone, that's open. Uh, and this for uh, new technologies like Frogan's is, is obviously very important. Was this something that was heavily on your mind uh, uh, at the onset when you created this system? You wanted it to be as open, as free as possible at a time maybe when those criteria weren't so important. Well, you know, initially it was uh, designed so that people could easily deploy it. Uh, people at the time thought that the idea was much too complicated and would never fly and so forth and so on um, until about five years later when they said, well, there's all these missing pieces. If you take a look at the original design, um, there's a bunch of things that were just in intentionally omitted because you have to get going, you have to get rolling. Um, you know, evolution takes place in generations in my belief. And so getting it started, even though it was purposely incomplete, it was designed to be simple, we knew it was incomplete. Um, I've occasionally had these uh, discussions with people that say, oh, there was this huge security flaw in the DNS. You know, the security system was just broken originally, and there was none, okay? Um, I talk about the, the first people that flew an airplane, if you're from the US, it's the Wright brothers, you know, they didn't have a drink cart, and they didn't have a bathroom and so forth and so on on the plane. They were trying to get the initial technology going, and they knew that people would build future generations of planes with new materials. So it's the same thing in the network. You try and give people a base of a set of ideas that they can build on and perhaps re-implement with new materials or new protocols or whatever. So that's a great segue into another item that I wanted to ask you about, which is uh, one of the aspects of the Frogan's technology is that it tries and I think succeeds to be in being completely international. Um, the domain names themselves are basically ASCII, English-only uh, identifiers. Um, is this a regret that uh, the DNS uh, was not built to be international uh, from the onset? Or are we talking about things like what you've just mentioned, that when the Wright brothers built their first plane, they didn't have stewardesses and toilets in them? <laughs> well, the DNS was originally built to be 8-bit clean. In other words, it would take 8-bit bytes and ship them around in binary. And what that meant was that if you took the original system and put uh, Unicode in it and so forth, it would work. Um, it's interesting that people uh, have made a lot of rules about what could or could not be in domain names and then made more rules so that you could encode more complicated things. So the original design was designed to be binary and you could put whatever you wanted in there. You wanted to put Unicode in, you could do that. Um, there was a time when uh, I worked with a, a startup to publish names in Unicode long before I can ever got around to doing it. And then all of a sudden people said, well, wait a second, you can't do that. It's supposed to be all in ASCII. So the all in ASCII thing is something that other people imposed upon it and then fixed it. So in my view, they created the problem and then solved it. So I don't really have much sympathy for the view that it wasn't designed to be international. I do have a question, though. Um, I'm, I wonder if there's any way to know whether it's a good idea or whether we should have kept it in a single or a small number of languages. Does it actually promote a sort of flatter world where it's easier to converse with other people, or does it promote separate domains? I don't know. I, not being a uh, speaker of Chinese or Japanese, I don't know whether or not these things um, actually make it happier. 
I know that there's some systems like air traffic control where everybody is required to speak English because, well, you really don't want planes to run into each other while translation is going on. I don't know. I wonder if some of the network shouldn't be like that. But uh, I leave it to the people that are experts in that to figure out the right answers. Yeah, that, that is a, a very interesting question, one that, that many people that deal with IDNs, international, internationalized domain names, uh, struggle with. Uh, some people, I mean, I've had discussions about this uh, in the past with others, and the example that's always given to me is that if the Chinese had invented the internet, we'd be happy that they're working on IDNs for us. But uh, as you say, uh, having one language, uh, common language, often helps um, keep systems secure secure and functional. So um, I don't know the answer to your question, obviously, but I think it's an interesting one philosophically. Although we, would, we said we wouldn't get into politics, so uh, perhaps we should steer clear of that topic. I would like to ask you, though, one of the, the, the features of the DNS is its robust uh, nature. Uh, Frogans, for example, sits on the DNS comfortably because it is so robust and uh, it's not something that uh, can break easily. Um, can you explain why the DNS is so robust so that people understand that the technology they use every day is something that isn't likely to break? Uh, well, you know, the early pioneers of the ARPANET and so forth were trying to... Uh introduced this idea of robustness. Uh, but uh, when I had an opportunity to design the, the DNS protocol, uh, I went in a different direction from the traditional one, where I just took the idea that all pieces of, all DNS information should be available for multiple servers. And then if you have a problem talking to one server, you don't just wait until it comes back up, you just try a different one. Um, and that's notions of reliability um, through redundancy that uh, I got from way back when, when I was working on various uh, space program uh, activities. Um, you know, people, people in today's uh, internet world where things crash and all the time and so forth don't realize that a lot of the reliability ideas came from things like the space program. And that's where I certainly got my, my uh, knowledge of redundant systems. So I just tried to build redundancy in everywhere. And I think that you find that modern protocols, uh, you know, with load balancers and routing and so forth, people are always trying to eliminate single points of failure. And the real question is, what, where's the right place to do it? Uh, but the DNS, uh, it may not have had security in version one, but it had that robustness and redundancy um, at the very core of its being. I want to ask you one last question, perhaps open it up for questions from the audience, although I do have a couple more questions if people are feeling shy. But uh, uh, just, um, you've invented the DNS. Where do you go from there? What are you doing these days? Um, I'm sort of thinking about the uh, next step. Uh, I've been involved in a number of startups and, and so forth. I think that the, if you take a look at what's out there today, the real issue is trying to figure out how to use this large amount of hardware and networking capacity that's out there. And so you see lots of ideas like Hadoop and Spark and so forth. And I'm trying to think about one generation beyond that. Paul, thanks very much. Can I uh, ask if there are any questions uh, from the audience? Or if, there, if we're getting questions from Twitter, please someone alert me. I see a hand up already. So uh, if we can get the microphone to that person. Once again, uh, feel free to ask your question in French and I'll translate. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, just quite a trivia question, actually. Uh, who came up with the name DNS and the domain name, name the word itself? Um, I didn't, okay. Um, it, it, it turns out that uh, basically people were talking about uh, hierarchical names and someone uh, had coined the term domain name, and I haven't quite figured it out. There's a couple of people. One of the things that's kind of interesting about the success of the internet is that I have all of these people who have come to me saying, well, I invented the idea.com, right? And I said, I actually don't remember who did it, and I don't say that you're wrong, but I will say that somebody else has already told me that they invented it. So it wasn't me. Uh, you can find prior RFCs that talk about domain names, 
but the prior RFCs didn't have any idea about how to implement it. And if you go look at some of them, they're fundamentally different from the way domain names ended up working. So I freely admit I stole the title. Um, there's a, a, the short answer about how I got involved in the DNS was one day John Postel walked into my office and said, we need to figure out this problem here, and here's five different proposals. Could you try and you know, see if you can bring them together and find some compromise? Um, and I knew John was busy with a lot of other things, so I ignored that and did as I liked. Um, and it took all of those five people a long time to figure out that I really hadn't used any of their DNA. But the, the idea of hierarchies was not new. I did not invent it. I think the pharaohs did, right? Um, and domain names is something that somebody else did. And you can find a prior articles by uh, a guy named Zazwing Zhu from SRI and a couple of other places. So I don't know who came up with it first. Sorry for a long answer to a quick question. No, it's a great answer. We're getting some fascinating insight into the history of the internet. And just to explain that John Postel uh, is the person that uh, managed the internet route before uh, an organization was set up to do it called Diana. Uh, and he's unfortunately passed away today. Are there any more questions? I see a hand in the middle there, please. Hello. Uh, we learned recently that the internet protocol was supposed to be secure when it has been designed, but there were some problems about intellectual property or something like that, I'm not sure. Uh, when you invented the DNS, have you thought about the, the authentication part? Uh, as I said, we didn't put security in. Um, it was a very different world back then. Uh, one of the things that you find in common with today is the people who are the professional security people. The Let's see, I, I don't want to annoy anybody locally. So uh, the NSAs of the world and the, the NIST of the world in the US, for example. Those people were telling us, we understand the security problem. We can't quite tell you about it. We have a solution under de development. Trust us, OK? Um, and so in looking at it all, I said, the DNS is based on set theory. It says that, oh, you can ask a question for a particular name, and you have sets of records to retrieve some subset of it. One of the things that you could always do is to put some cryptographic signature on the data. Um, I didn't think it was necessary to do it at the time, and we didn't have the capacity at the time, and I always thought that we could do it later. So DNSSEC was invented by some other people, not my design. Um, to deal with it. It's not the way I would have done it, but it's starting to gain traction in some places, and I think that it will either A, solve that problem, or B, it will inform us about what we need to do to come up with the next version of DNSSEC to solve its problem. Um, the internet protocol similarly didn't really have security in it. People at the time, the security experts at the time, said, well, we'll get around to telling you we're working on it. Um, it became a problem for all of us, I think, over the years. Um, the world today is just fundamentally different, so I don't think you can look at the design choices that were made then without thinking about how the world was then. Thank you. Any more questions for Paul? Yes, this one here. Hello, thank you. Uh, could you tell us a bit about the way uh, the DNS was deployed uh, over the internet? I mean. Uh, who decided to do that, and how did you get traction from international uh, partners? I don't know. Well, can you tell us uh, how, how it did work? Sure. Um, the, uh, the, way it the reason that the DNS was able to spread was that um, we were able to provide a rock-solid rock solid infrastructure of root-level servers very early on. Um, and uh, meanwhile, the people at Berkeley were distributing DNS code that was <laughs> very crash prone, you know, bind. Does anybody here know what bind stands for? There are people that say bind is not debugged is what it means. But at any rate, um, they distributed it with uh, all of the Unix systems that were very popular. So we were able to have root servers up and to have uh, systems in operation running Unix that relied upon the, the DNS three years after the initial design. 
very rapidly because of the Berkeley distribution and because we had, we were able to arrange for some redundant root servers that have gotten even more redundant since then. Um, and that's how we got going. And part of it was that uh, John and the managers said, well, all right, if you want to use new names, if you want to get any more new names, you're going to have to eventually transition to the DNS. So there was this fiat in place. But basically, the real thing that sold it was we told people, if you own your domain, if you want to add a new machine, you can do it. And there's a famous article, I think, in uh, Wired magazine, the title of which is, with DNS, you can add hosts on Christmas. And what it meant was that early on, if you wanted to get added to the host table, you were able to do it from 9 AM to 5 PM Pacific time. So you guys would kind of like be out of luck if you wanted to call in the morning, because the SRI wasn't open. And it wasn't open on weekends. Can you imagine not being able to change the parameters of your network on weekends or you know, you know, people would call up and say, hey, uh, the system's crashed. And you say, well, you know, I have to wait for California to wake up before I can do anything. I mean, the, the point was is that it, it gave people the ability to manage their own network, create their own namespaces, add their own hosts. And as the network started growing and as people started to get I, IBM PCs and more workstations to add to it, they didn't want to be calling up California. And you know the, the, the people at SRI started out with three people to manage all of the naming and so forth for the whole network. By the time that we transitioned to a commercial operation, they run that staff up to 23 people that were just answering phone calls, saying, hi, I want a new host name. Uh, <laughs> you know, it just doesn't scale. So you know, there was a bunch of computer hardware and networking coming down the road that wanted to figure out how to be used. And there was a need to be able to let people, enable people to configure their own stuff. And that was the winning combination. Um, you know, Frogans has a much harder sell because you're running a displacement sale. There wasn't anybody else that said, here's how you can get your own names and manage your own network. This was, the DNS was the only way to do it. So you could either, A, use the host table, and people are telling you that it's going to go away, and you can't do it on weekends. Um, or you could use the DNS. So it wasn't a displacement sale, as they say. You know, you've got a harder row to hoe um, in the sense that you've, people are going to say, well, you know, I have all of these other things I could do. You know, what's the, what's the real killer app here? Um, but, uh, you know, if it, was, if it was easy, everybody would do it. <laughs> and I have to compliment the, the Frogans people, at least. Um, you know, they, they are, there's so many of these uh, new top level domains like dot sucks and on and on and on where they don't seem to use any useful purpose and don't seem to be even trying for innovation. I mean, God bless you and Godspeed, but you know, it's, it's going to be harder for you than it was for me. Thanks, Paul. Perhaps one last question if there is one. We have time for one more. If you see me squinting, it's just that the stage lights are in my eyes. So I really, it's like looking at a, a blank wall just to explain why I have that strange facial expression whenever I'm asking something. Any more questions? In which case, Paul, it's been an absolute privilege having to have you with us. Thank you very, very much. Thanks.